Welcome to Sheepdog Nation Podcast, the only place on the internet where law enforcement and their families can come to be understood, supported, and stood up for. Here's your host, the always entertaining, down-to-earth, yet-in-your-face truth speaker and Leo herself, Autumn Schmidt. What is up, Sheepdog Nation? Welcome to another podcast with, is that better? Okay, that's a lot better. With me, your host, Autumn Clifford. Or... Autumn Schmidt, that's my married name, but I'm still I'm still having uh, a problems remembering that. <laughs> Today I'm really excited um, to bring you this guest. So this guest, his name is Deputy Garrett Tesla, and he um, he has his own podcast. And I actually really enjoy his podcast. It's called The Squad Room, and um, I enjoy his podcast. And so I asked him to come on and talk with us a little bit about what got him into it. And, um, you know, I want to hear about him and his experience um, from being a deputy. He was just telling me he's been on patrol like 11 out of the 14 years. Isn't that right, Garrett? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to have you. So welcome, Garrett. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be here and honored to be asked to be on. So yeah, like you just mentioned, I've got about just approaching 14 years uh, of active duty law enforcement. For the last six of those, I've been a sergeant. I'm lucky enough to uh, lead a group of people that are in this job. Uh, I started this as a second career, kind of in my late 20s. I came out of actually working in the film and music industry uh, here in California uh, and did an about face and decided to go into service. Uh, that's a, a whole long story that would take up the entire podcast, but um, <laughs> uh uh, and so, yeah, I work in Southern California for a, a decent sized uh, sheriff's office. Uh, we have about between our custody division and our uh, law enforcement side, we have about 800 sworn officers. Wow. That is big. It's big in some parts, but uh, in Southern California, that would be considered very small. almost. See, <laughs> that's interesting. So, so one of our biggest agencies is the Maine State Police in, in Maine, obviously, and um, where I work and where I'm from, and they, they have like 300. <laughs> yeah. So, it's all would be massive. Right. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Keep going. So, keep telling me. So, tell us about California. What's it like to be a deputy over there? Um, you know, it's interesting. I never, there's a couple things I never expected with the job when I, when I signed up. One was how much we would be involved in uh, dealing with natural disasters. Uh, mm -hmm. It never occurred to me that law enforcement is engaged in the stuff like, I mean, we're famous, my area, uh, just north of uh, Los Angeles, we're famous for forest fires and wildfires mm -hmm. that get out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we spent a lot of last year dealing with forest fires that you know, burned down neighborhoods and homes and then a debris flow that resulted from that that killed 23 people and um, how much like later today, my partners are going out and doing evacuations for the next rainstorm because they're concerned about mudslides that'll take out new neighborhoods. So that was that that's uh, one thing that I never expected. And then just how um, regardless of where you are, what kind of environment you're in, um, how much this job is similar. You're up in Maine. I'm out here in Southern California. And we could definitely, we could sit down and have a beer and we would be able to talk about the same types of calls, regardless, you say you work for a department of a dozen or you work for a department of 10,000, you know, mm -hmm. we've, all, we've all had a shared experience. Um, so a lot of the same stuff that anyone else deals with, um, you know, out here and we have being th this close to LA, we have our probably more interactions with some high profile people than you might in mm -hmm. um, more remote areas, but that's probably the only thing about it that's any different than anywhere else. Mm. Well, the weather, is it warm? The weather, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know that, you know, right now a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, country is snowed in and frozen over and I'm more worried about the, a little rain. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, it's, it's a nice patrol environment. I'm from Colorado originally. Oh. And uh, whenever I come home uh, in the winter to visit family there, I just uh, tip my hat to any of those officers who are out there, you know, running, running code at 3 a.m., spinning their tires going 10 miles an hour through the ice and snow to get somewhere. Uh, definitely not an environment I would be comfortable working in. No, that, that's my environment. Currently, right now, as I look out my window at the frozen tundra, it's um, last time I checked, it's seven degrees. And right now, I'm um, talking to Garrett, and it's like um, it's just past uh, noon my time. So it's like fully warm, and it's like seven degrees. <laughs> and so, yeah, I definitely, I totally understand. You know, you bring up a really good point that I really want Sheepdog Nation to hear. Um, and, and it's interesting to me, but like, like you said, um, that you, uh, 
what you didn't realize was like, you know, in where your agency, um, you guys like have to deal with like the natural disasters. Like that's, I think it's like really, it's not obviously like wicked cool, but I think it, it kind of is to give like, especially new officers, like, Hey guys, like, listen up. It's not all about like just going out and arresting the bad guys and getting the drugs off the street and getting the drunks off the street. Like we do have to deal with shit like that too. So I, I really love that you brought that up because it's definitely a different side of policing. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was, a, that was a learning curve. And then I remember uh, my department too in California, and I'm not sure how it is there, but in California, we, the sheriff's offices can also, uh, depending on local ordinance function as the coroner's office mm. coroner's bureau or the coroner's detectives. Right. So we, we have a dual function of also being coroner's detectives. And so I wasn't, I never fully grasped that through the Academy. And then it wasn't until I was on field training and we went out to my first coroner call and my field training officers with me. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry, you want me to do what with the dead body? Uh, and and so that was a whole other learning experience too. And, and a side of it I never thought of was dealing with the death investigations, but then the families and stuff like that, which you're dealing with, you know, as in the result of some of these tragic or horrific deaths. And yeah, it's not about just going out and hooking and booking and, and chasing down the bad guys. That's the fun stuff. But there's anyone with any, a couple of years on, I'll tell you, there's, there's way more nuance to this job than anyone could ever really articulate. Mm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, okay, so let me ask you this. Can you tell us how you, like, what made you decide to start your podcast and what, tell Sheepdog Nation what your podcast is about and the basis around it? So, yeah, the podcast, I started that in um, 2015 uh, and it's called The Squad Room. And it was really started as I, I was dealing with some stuff uh, that a lot of guys and girls deal with after about 10 years on in which, you know, I was overweight. I was struggling uh, to stay awake. I had no energy. Um, my, I kept uh, expanding my, uh, my, my Sam Brown and, um, you know, was just out of shape, fatigued, dealing with uh, sleep disorders and the stress of the job and everything was just kind of piling on. And I knew I needed to make a change. I didn't know where to start necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've never been like a hardcore dedicated athlete or mm-hmm fitness buff. It's always been something I've done sort of reluctantly. And, um, I have always been the guy who is, you know, like I I always, I joke on my show about like growing up being a kid who fit into the Husky clothes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if I, you remember like back in the day, like when JC Penney's was actually a catalog order, Mm -hmm. uh, you would order the Husky size for like the bigger kids. It was not, it was a nice way of calling you chubby really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so anyway, like it was never natural to me and I was never involved in, in, in team sports to be in an environment where you had that kind of peer pressure to be in shape. And really the academy was the best experience I ever had with, with my physical fitness because there was that peer pressure. It was positive peer pressure and negative, but it was mostly positive peer pressure. You wanted to be part of the group. You wanted this job. You wanted to get through this experience. So you had to be fit. And then, you know, I got married and two kids later and I had a bike accident in which I broke my back and uh, devolved to this point where I realized I need to do something, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know where to start. And so I started asking questions and asking around and emailing experts in a variety of fields. And and some of them were kind enough to answer back. And I started learning a little bit. And as I was in briefings talking about some of these things that I'd learned, people were coming up to me and pulling me aside and be like, hey, I'm struggling with my sleep issues too, or, um, uh, you know, I'm stressed about the job or the, my, my, my wife or whatever, you know, those same things, people were coming up to me in my own department mm. and I was getting some affirmation there that not only I needed these things, but my partners needed these things. And if my partners need these things, then other people need them too. So here I have some information that I now have. Why shouldn't I share it? Um, uh, it, the, the podcast, I love podcasts in general. I listen to a ton of them. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so it just sort of tickled a creative uh, bone for me too, to be able to come to try it. And I just thought, well, you know, if I, if I call up like Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, for example, who's been on the show um, and I ask him to, to, to talk to me for an hour, just me and him one-on-one, he'd be like, cool. Yes. That'll be $500 please. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if I have a podcast, then people will come that actually want to come on and talk about things with me and, so it was a way to get a lot of these subject matter experts and get them to give me their information. And then I could share it with other law enforcement officers and first responders, which is a, a community I care very deeply about. Uh, and, um, 
and it's working, you know. Uh, sure enough, no shock, same officers from around the country and from around the world are having the same issues, the same stress issues or weight and health management issues and that sort of stuff. So it, it, it got a great response. And um, my personal passion is about developing emerging leaders in mm -hmm. law enforcement. And so the show has taken on a lot of that as well. Mm. And it's now with the time on and approaching a hundred episodes. It's amazing. That, uh, and there's the long, most of them are long form interviews, but then there's shorter episodes I do that are just me talking about a particular topic, something I've learned or something I've used that has been successful for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, it's really turned into a, a wonderful community of people who are just wanting to go out and be true leaders in the profession. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. And like, so <clears throat> would you say, cause I'm like really big, one thing that I'm extremely big on and like I'm wicked passionate about and the reason like, it was like in the top three reasons why I started my podcast is because like you, I was experiencing my own shit, right? And one thing that really bothers me is like the, the brotherhood, right? The brother and sisterhood, like where is it? Like, where, I don't know what your agency and I can't speak for every single agency out there. I just can't, but I can speak for, you know, my experience and I can speak for what my followers tell me. And um, <clears throat> I know that the, I know that due to the certain maybe circumstances, politically, whatever, the times, you know, obviously we've like lost some of that brother and sisterhood and in any ways. And so, um, you know, I talk a lot about that, but I also am very passionate about letting officers know like, hey, you're not just a cop. Like so many officers are like, you know, and I know you see this, but they're just like, oh, you know, fuck, I, I'm just a cop. Like, what the hell could I ever go do? Like, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. And like, how many times have I pulled up car to car with a guy or a girl? And they're like, well, this is all I've ever done. And I'm miserable. And my, my spouse hates me and my kids don't talk to me, but you know what? There's nothing else I can do. Like, this is it. And, and would you agree? Like, would, for you is like, was your starting your podcast? Was that like your way of being like, Hey, I'm, I'm more than just a cop or like, let me help other cops. Like, I don't know. I just feel like I feel like other cops seem to know, right? Like that they could do, like if they want to start a podcast, go ahead. If you want to go start a freaking YouTube channel, go ahead. If you want to go become a realtor or, you know, who, whatever you want to do, like you, you have so much to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. The, the, this job is, is, um, can be intoxicating for the adrenaline dump oh, we all get. Yes. And then we, we hang on to that. And then as anybody who's had any time on knows, like you slowly give up these other bits and pieces of yourself because of the time and then the, the poor sleep. And then, you, you know, you add a family and kids and you start taking away pieces of yourself and you're giving them off to other parts of your life. And then your identity only becomes that you are a cop. Mm -hmm. And that's so not true. Mm -hmm. And you are, anybody is so many things. And um, it's, it's something that you have to reclaim though. And you, and, and for people who aren't there yet, you need to, you really need to fight to stay uh, with those identities that are outside law enforcement mm -hmm. and yeah, go be creative. Like one thing that I, I didn't like was this, um, you know, if you're, if you have a creative side that is typically, I won't say frowned upon, but it's sort of uh, dismissed mm. uh, in a way that I think, you know, like if you're a musician off duty or something like that, or you go want to go play in a band, um, we are this very type A alpha, you know, like um, we think in logic and we think in black and white. Mm -hmm. and none of us are black and white. Uh, we can think that way, but we can't act that way. We have to be able to be fluid with these other identities and these things outside of law enforcement. And it's what's going to keep you much healthier. Mm -hmm. And if this job after 10 years is not for you anymore, that's okay. Like a lot of guys struggle with that and a lot of girls and I just had a friend recently medically retire and he was really concerned about what he was going to do next and, and what his identity would be. And uh, he just recently told me, he's like, you know what? It's, it's great. And it's never as bad. It's not as bad as you think it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. but he, has, he found what he needed to go to next, his next purpose. Right. And just like our, our, our veterans coming out of the military who lack direction, it's about purpose. If you have a purpose in what you're doing, you're going to be fine. If you want to go be a real estate broker, understand why you want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, and my dad happens to be a real estate broker, right? So I, this is a good one for me. And a lot of cops become real estate brokers. Um, you know, is it because you want time with your family and you want the weekends off? I, I totally get that. And anybody else would get that too. Uh, do you get value out of helping people get into their first home? Well, you should, right? But have your purpose 
mm-hmm. and understand what you're getting out of it. And then I think that makes it so much easier. Mm-hmm. I understand. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I think that like what you said, the purpose thing, because I I also think that, you know, a lot of cops find themselves in like limbo, you know, like they're just like what you said, like, okay, like I'm, I, I don't fit in like this. This is killing me. This job is killing me. But, but, oh my gosh, like, what are all these people going to think? And then like, what the hell am I going to do? And like, who am I to even want this? And, and you're right. It's all about finding purpose, 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 you know, cause I come across a lot of um, officers who are former, like not in the job anymore, no problem. And um, you know, they just, some of them are not finding purpose. And so they're kind of like, I don't know what to do. Like, I, and they get real negative and they get down on themselves, you know? It's, it's something I, ca- I talk about on the show of these held assumptions about ourselves. And we mm-hmm. can have these, uh, these held beliefs that we need to turn into opportunity statements, right? Mm-hmm. So this held belief that, uh, you know, and I'm right in this pocket right now where I'm kind of on the backside of my career. I can see retirement. It's still off in the distance, but it's coming. It's more realistic now than it certainly was when I started. But now I got those golden handcuffs of that, of that pension, right? Mm-hmm. And if I were to leave, I'd be giving up a, a significant amount of a pension, and that's Absolutely. very enticing, right? And that's what kind of keeps a lot of the guys there. So this held assumption, it would be that I need to stay for the pension. Mm-hmm. But the opportunity statement is, well, I could potentially make more money outside of law enforcement, which would then, you know, uh, contribute to my family in a greater way than the pension ever would. Mm-hmm. We have to flip our focus sometimes on who we think we have to be versus who we can be. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds very like Tony Robbins, self-help, self-development kind of thing, but it's absolutely true that um, we have to be aware of the assumptions we're holding about ourselves mm-hmm. and really be critical of those, not, not of ourselves, but of critical of the assumptions we hold about ourselves and look at the ways that we can flip those into opportunity statements. A hundred percent. And I love that. And you know what? I'm going to be real with you. There's a lot of us in Chief Dog Nation that need fucking self-help and we need Tony Robbins, you know, but like, you know, I love what you said, and it's well, so true. And you're right, and and a lot of people need that, including me, uh, first and foremost, right? I mean, I started a whole podcast because it was about self improvement and improving me. People tend to cringe at that idea. I prefer the idea of like personal development, you know, and using a phrase like that. I think everybody, cop or not, should be continually learning through their career and their life and developing themselves. And if you don't have something that you're working on personally, um, then you're, you're missing out on a lot of great things if you're not focused on your own development. I love this. I love this. Thank you for saying this. I say it all the fucking time, but I just want to say thank you so much because, you know, I actually just made a post on this about this on Instagram and it's so true. Like, yes, you're a cop or you're, you know, you're the firefighter, you're the sheepdog, you're the first responder, right? But well, I shouldn't even say firefighters because all of y'all have other jobs because you work two fucking days a week. <laughs> I'm not jealous or anything. <laughs> right. Anyways, um, but the thing is, is like, yeah, is as far as like cops, like, and you, you know, and the thing is, here's the thing, Garrett, is like, if cops, like, if, if we think, if we can open up our minds for just a moment, we literally could get free training and just about anything that we want that we can then utilize on like as a side business, like, you know, the accident, like reconstruction. Mm-hmm. I know cops that are getting paid big money by insurance companies right now. And they got that training getting paid, you know, and while they're on the job, you know, canine handlers who go and breed or train dogs, big stuff. You know, we got guys very highly trained on SWAT and, and just all these different things that like you said, like, you know, flipping your opportunity statement, which is huge, but just also like taking a look at it that way. And I, and I just think it's huge, you know? So thank you for yeah, sharing. With Absolutely. That. You got high tech crimes guys, guys who are good in computers can go do forensics evidence stuff for people. The, the thing I think anyone needs to know is you, if you're leaving law enforcement, whether you're retiring or you're just, you're, you're done and need to move on is you need to have that exit plan, mm-hmm. right? You can't just quit and go work at Costco. Although Costco has great benefits for the retiring guys, but you need something. And, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. We have, we all have unique skills and training that are unusual and are sought after by companies. You just have to be willing to look. And then you have to be willing to like be the person who, who does it. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. trust me, I, there are many times I put out an episode or I interview someone and go, I don't know why I'm the one who's doing this. Like there's somebody out there who is much more well-versed in this topic than I am. Who's a much better speaker on mic, who uh, is much better on camera, who has, you know, higher rank than me and they should be doing this. 
you know, and that's what we all deal with. And, and oftentimes it's called the imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. right? Like, who, who am I to be the one to yep. go out and teach firearms instruction uh, to people? But it's like, the way I look at it is like, you know what? If there was someone who was more qualified out there doing it, they'd be doing it. Yes. And so we all have an opportunity to do stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I love, I have to say, that's such a fucking good point too, because we all do that, especially us type A people. I know for me, it stopped me from doing this podcast for three years, like three years. I like wrote all the content. I wrote articles. I wrote all this stuff. And I'm like, oh no, no, no. Who the fuck am I? Mm -mm, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Nobody's going to listen to me. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to listen to what I have to say. And, and then I get on and I started my podcast just because I wanted a place to rant. And all of a sudden, people cared. And it's, and it's like, and that's the same for you and for everybody listening. It's like, if you're thinking about it, if the idea is in your head, it's in your head for a friggin' reason, man. And like, go do it. And, but the more, here's the thing, is the more you sit around and, and just toss it around and like, don't take action, the idea is going to go from your head to somebody else's and someone's going to do it, you know, be the person that takes the action on it. Yeah, someone's going to do it and you're going to give yourself all the reasons why you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I was the same way. I, I, I spent so much time trying to come up with a name for the show because <laughs> I wanted, you know, like it was a way to delay actually hitting publish on that first post was like, well, I mean, I, you know, I need to come up with a name and I'd come up with 10 names and then I'd come up with 10 more and then I would delay actually recording something and putting something out because I, you know, I needed to, and then I needed a logo and like, whatever. No, you know, we all deal with it. Mm -hmm. The biggest hurdle I've ever had in this entire process or in, in my experience was hitting publish on that first episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Mm. like you said, you, you, someone that I, I don't know about you, but I remember the first time I saw that it got downloaded and I knew it wasn't my mom. Right. And it was like, wait, someone else out there listened. I know. <laughs> and then someone else. And then you get an email and then you get someone who's listening in Australia, you know, and then you, then your mind kind of blows. This medium, this specific medium of podcasting is amazing for that kind of reach, but there's nothing that's preventing anybody from having that same reach or just locally having a significant impact in their own community. Yes. And like, so let me ask you your opinion. What would be your opinion? So part of my post yesterday that I, I said that is right along in this topic and I really want to hear your opinion on is I just said, you know, dear former cop, instead of, you know, sitting around and secluding yourself from the world, go out and help somebody with your experience. Like, what would you say? Like, I know and that honestly it's endless, but I just want to hear like your ideas. Like, what would you say to like this former cop or current cop or, you know, just, you know, a sheepdog who just needs, who wants to help, but has no idea how, mm-hmm. but what would you say? Yeah, I'm of the belief that anybody in this job, whether you are uh, in the application process, whether you've been in the job for a while, whether you're a supervisor or you're retired, we as a collective group, anywhere in that spectrum, we have an obligation to lead. Mm -hmm. We have more training than the rest of the public in how to do this correctly, but also we have more opportunity to connect and contact more people in our day-to-day job than anybody else, right? Mm-hmm. Think there's no other job where you might go out and contact 20, 30 people in a, in a regular shift, and that's not even a busy shift, right? No, exactly, yep. And so think about how if you impact, you know, if you can impact 20 to 30 people per day, and then you extrapolate that out, you have enormous impact that you can create. And so the, for, the, for the retired guys, use that knowledge and experience you know, and don't, don't, don't bring the salt with you because mm-hmm. that's not going to, that's not going to solve anything. That's got, there's issues that might need to be worked through, but there's uh, an incredible opportunity to teach the younger generation and not in a back in my day, it was, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it was, it helped, help develop those next leaders from your agency. Mm-hmm. You know, take time. A lot of agencies are really reluctant to do leadership development or succession planning. They don't want to like pick favorites or, you know, identify people too early that they think are going to be the next lieutenants and captains or whatever. But as a result of that, we end up with a leadership vacuum where people who are rookies Mm -hmm. uh, uh, should be getting some leadership experience and knowledge and training from their departments, but they aren't. Mm -hmm. And I'm of the firm belief that doesn't matter if you're a rookie, doesn't matter if you're a lieutenant, captain, commander, chief, whatever, 
you each have an opportunity and an obligation to lead within your role. Mm -hmm. Yep. I know. And you make me want to say, where did leadership go in law enforcement? I totally did an episode on that, but tell me your opinion. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's still, there's obviously still bright, bright spots um, yes, of course. around the country of people who are doing really, really good work. Uh, and you look to uh, departments like Scottsdale has a great leadership development program where they intentionally teach and enthuse uh, or infuse servant leadership into their training of their uh, future sergeants and future mm -hmm. commands. Um, but, you know, people are, and I say people like it, to me, it seems like administrators are, are very challenged. And I, I, I don't know if I'd ever, I don't think I'd ever want to be a chief in these, in this environment where you're under such political pressure to not do anything mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, you're kind of getting pulled in all these different directions. Um, you know, it's, I guess that's the whole point of what I'm trying to accomplish these days is bring back some of that leadership. And if we can get this new generation to adopt the idea that they are leaders as rookies, as early people in their people early in their career, and then bring that with them, we can bring this back into law enforcement. 100%. Uh, it's there. Uh, but you know, it gets stifled a lot mm -hmm. and it's, um, it takes someone really willing to stick their neck out and we need more of those people for sure. A hundred percent. I love that. The, the sticking of the neck out. We definitely need more of that. Now I'm going to kind of switch um, topics, but I just want to ask you, do you think, so like we, you kind of touched upon it a little bit earlier um, right when we started just talking about your story and stuff like that and um, stress and stress of the job. Can we talk a little bit about that for you? Like, what have you experienced and has like for stress as far as obviously we know there's a fuck ton of stress, but like, what have you noticed that's like helped you deal with it, manage it? Uh, a lot of the stuff that I, I've, I've learned honestly through this show has been instrumental because I wasn't dealing with the stress real well. I wasn't, I wasn't falling apart necessarily either, but I, I was one of those guys who got in the job. I didn't, uh, I got married about a year after coming on the job. So, um, I was not, and then my kids were pretty early on. So I was never like the guy who was working, uh, every day of the week doing constant overtime just cause he wanted to be at the job. You know, I wasn't that, but, um, it was, it was kind of a slow drip. Like we talk about sometimes of that slow drip of corrosiveness of, you know, the, the constant death calls and the traffic accidents and the shootings and, like it was, it was kind of that stuff. And, um, so the things that I found that I, I tend to use, or well, I was going to say was, so I had stuff early on in my career, but then, like I mentioned, I was in a, a mountain biking accident, which, um, severely, severely curtailed my ability to mountain bike for a long time or, or cycle. And so I kind of had that piece of me taken away a little bit. Mm. And, you know, as I married then kids and the free time starts to go away very quickly. And then, so little by little, I had these parts of me that were, you know, like, I like to read. So, but reading kind of went away because I had the kids now or all these little things sort of took over and then ended up realizing that my, the only identity I did have left was as, as a cop. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, anyone who has ever like had their spouse tell them like, don't treat me like one of your suspects <laughs> as you're <laughs> asking questions knows like, it's, it, it just, I, I realized I got to the point where I'm not anything else. The only people I, I hang out with cops and I don't even hang out with those people. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's a long, long answer to your question. It's a problem having another podcast around a podcast cause we'll talk. Uh, <laughs> but what I've found out of it is, um, some sort of mindfulness. I try different things. Uh, I journal a lot to me. Journaling has been very successful. Mm. I try to meditate, but I'm just never consistent with it. I always enjoy it when I do it and I always have success. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to say that you've success, you, you can't really be successful meditating. But what I mean is just trying it is a success. And if you can, you know, do it for a couple of days in a row, then I do find that I am more calm and that I'm uh, more thoughtful and I'm more aware. Mm -hmm. uh, but journaling to me is big. Um, I do a lot of that because of the show and I like to be creative. So I write things out and I think, and I have to get these things out of my head. Otherwise they bounce around in my brain all day long. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But once it's on paper, I get it out. You know, physical exercise is absolutely important, not only for the physical demands of our job, but we just got to, we have to off gas that, that stress and that cortisol that we, our body physically makes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get rid of that and replace it with some good dopamine and serotonin. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, uh, working out is important uh, to me. I don't do it nearly as much as I want to or should, but uh, you know, it's just, it's an, it's, it's I, my wife recently finally uh, admitted that she realizes that if I don't go to the gym, that I'm a much bigger problem to deal with than if I get to go to the gym. <laughs> so. Yes. My husband, he's a state trooper and it's the same thing. I'm like, go, 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 bye, bye. <laughs> and then immediately you, you get a lot of that out of you by, by just going and, and doing something, some simple movement, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for other people, like creative, a lot of, you know, if you're a musician, man, be, go be a musician, you know, mm. uh, do something that's, that's developing a skill. The last thing you want to do is de-stress by sitting on the couch and drinking, you know, three Jack and Cokes and then a fourth Jack and Coke and then a fifth, you know, mm-hmm. um, that's, that is only going to lead to uh, a complete disaster. Mm-hmm. Yep. But you know what? Unfortunately, a lot of people find themselves in that like vortex, you know? Absolutely. And I get it. I do. I a hundred percent get it. And I would be completely hypocritical if I didn't say that at times I am that way too. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that I don't get into my own ruts and then have to claw myself back out of them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm, I'm, I try to be very upfront and honest on my show about how this is the show started about me trying to learn how to fix myself. So I am sharing things I've learned from that perspective, not from the perspective of the guru who knows everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I go through my own stuff still, uh, at, like every day. We all do. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, now, do you care to share with us? Do you have like a like? I always like to ask this question because it gives us perspective um, of like what cops go through. But do you? Can you share with us? Do you have like a one of your most stressful situations you've ever been in, like on the job? Hmm. You know, I, I, um, in thinking about that, you know, we all have, again, it goes back to this idea that whether you're in Southern California or Maine, we all have those acute stress incidents, you know, acute being those one-off or those very, those spikes in stress that are usually call related, right? A shooting or something like that. And I've had, you know, for in 14 years, the average of, you know, it's, there's been plenty of those. I mean, I can think of, you know, bank robbery where I was first at, where there were hostages inside and I was like, just barely not a rookie. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, I've been to OISs. We've had active shooters uh, in my area wow. that have taken on multiple people. But I really, to me, I think to answer that question, um, the, the biggest stress I've dealt with was really more of a chronic stress situation where I mentioned this debris flow we had uh, in January. Just We just passed the anniversary of it where Largest uh, forest fire in California state history at the time uh, burned through a, a bunch of uh, hills above our towns. And we have these steep mountains. Uh, like we're sandwiched between, I'm in Santa Barbara, and we're sandwiched between these steep mountains and the ocean. Mm-hmm. And so this forest fire burned all of these mountains, uh, the, 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 the foliage and the trees on these mountains, causing uh, the, them to become unstable. We then had a huge rainstorm, one of the biggest rainstorms in the last hundred years, and it caused this really an avalanche is the easiest way to describe it, where the mud slid, it picked up a bunch of rocks and trees, and it basically started taking out neighborhoods like crazy. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of homes destroyed, huge, and these are like multi million dollar homes. Um, huge properties. And the only reason no more people weren't killed was because the properties were so big. These houses mm-hmm. were so big. If this were like your regular, like middle-class neighborhood, hundreds of people would have been killed because the mm-hmm. homes are closer together. Anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 23 people died, you know, stories of people getting pulled out of the mud after two days of being trapped. And, um, you know, I, I have so many partners who responded within minutes and were, you know, pulling, dead kids out of the mud and mm-hmm. um, you know, families who'd lost kids and giving death notifications to kids. So it was this long event where just for several days, we couldn't even get to parts of town because of the mud. And then the slow process of trying to secure this area, 
we had looters coming in trying to take advantage. We had contractors coming in trying to take advantage of people. So we had to shut this whole area down. And I worked a crazy amount. I think I worked 46 out of 48 days straight. And wow. our, well, no, like 14 hour shifts. And it was knowing that you're going into work and you're going to be dealing with people who lost their homes, who've lost family members. Um, you're going to be dealing with media who are trying to get into the scene and people are going to be taking it out on you because you're a representative of the government that has shut down, you know, so it was, it was a chronic stress situation, but it was the longest, most protracted thing I've ever been involved in. And it was actually the, I actually gave a Ted talk about this, uh, this whole slide and my experience on it. And that actually I gave a talk about the positive part of it, uh, which was about developing these relationships with citizens who were coming in and helping us and being what I call second responders. Uh, but the, there were, it was, it's the yin and yang of it. There was that positive side I gave the TED talk on, but the chronic stress side was this constant, like never ending 14 hours a day, no days off kind of environment where mm. you're dealing with these people. And that, and you know, I love that you shared that because yet again, like I said, like it's just such a different perspective. And usually when I ask, you know, officers, this is obviously a shoot or, you know, a fight or something like that. And like, I just, I really respect that, that perspective because I think everybody needs to hear this. Like it's not all going to battle, you know, sometimes it's stuff like this and it, that is in a, in a circumstance, it is going to battle in another like perspective, but it's, it's different than like what the media and what people coming into this job, like think it is, you know, so yeah, yeah I, I can see that. And, you know, something to point out for people too, if they, something like 80% of the stress of our job comes from organizational stress, mm. you know, from your, your command, from your supervisor, from your sergeant being, you know, you know, on you. So it's important to acknowledge that too and understand that you, though you may not feel like you've had anything uh, stressful in your career happen, like a shooting or anything like that, that you still are under stress and that the things that go on in your department, the politics or um, having a micromanager as a boss, those things do affect you still. And you need to be able to manage those things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you need to be able to deal with them and deal with them effectively. Otherwise you still end up with the stress conditions you would as if you were had a, a, an acute episode of something. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that because it's so true. And yeah, I talk about that a lot. The organizational stresses that I think that's, that, like that's a huge killer mm -hmm. i mean it kills a lot of cops you know whether we know it or not you know Absolutely. so well thank you and um and as we wrap this up do you can you give some advice to rookies what would you say to them mm. um you know i i i really love working with young officers mm -hmm. um you know lots of lots of people think that this new generation quote unquote they're not even millennials anymore. The millennials aren't even, it's the, it's the generation after them. But uh, I find a lot, I find they bring a lot of energy and perspective and enthusiasm to the job. And we're just not, we're not talking to them in their language. You know, they say that, you know, they millennials want to know what's in it for them. And that's true. But anybody who has a job that's going to demand this much of them has a right to know what's in it for them. So it's incumbent upon us, especially the supervisors, and the people who've got some time on to tell them and show them that what's in it for you is this incredible career where you will never, I, I've said this many times, I've never gone home at the end of a day, of a, at the end of a shift and wondered if I did something good that day, mm. right? If I, if I was out like in marketing selling toilet paper, I'd have a hard time wondering if I actually made an impact that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was in music, that's why I left music was like, what am I doing? I'm not doing anything with my life here except selling little plastic pieces of or pieces of plastic that have songs on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never had that challenge any uh, on any single shift where I was like, did I do anything good today? You uh, just by showing up, strapping on a gun belt and a vest, you went out and did something good. Mm -hmm. You know, you stepped up and you put your toes on that thin blue line. You never have to worry about doing a good, uh, doing something that's a value of purpose, uh, serving something bigger than you when you're in this job. And we just need to make sure that the rookies understand that. Mm. You know, but some tactical things, I would say, make sure you keep your friends. We touched on this a little bit, but keep your friends outside of law enforcement. Make sure you have people who you can go to who have no idea what it's like to be a cop. And as a rookie, it's really tempting to be around this new environment that's, a, like I say, is an adrenaline dump, you know, and want to be around it all the time. Fight that. 
fight to keep your friends who are outside law enforcement. It's hard when you're on rotating shifts and you work weekends and everyone else is out at the, at the bar and you're at, at work. It, you will slowly create distance just by that fact. You got to fight to keep those friends around and, um, and, and try to avoid hanging out with just cops. It's okay to hang out with cops, but be mindful of where you're spending your time because you're just going to talk in an echo chamber of stories and, and eventually bitterness mm -hmm. and sarcasm and cynicism mm -hmm. that is going to kill you. You know, mm -hmm. our cynicism keeps us alive on a traffic stop. Your cynicism about what the driver's intentions are, what they're doing with their hands, that's all cynicism that keeps us alive. But the minute we take off that uniform, we need to, we need to take off that cynicism too, otherwise it's going to kill us. Yep, 100%. Uh, something else, you know, it's, it's much easier to maintain your physical discipline than it is to regain it. Trust me, mm -hmm. I know that one. Um, it's, that's really important. And then just take those days off, you know. Don't come to work 24-7. Have a hobby that's outside the law enforcement stuff. It's cool to want to enjoy shooting guns or, use, or going out to jiu-jitsu class or whatever, but have something that's completely unrelated to law enforcement that, that, doesn't, that you don't associate with the job at all. Mm -hmm. And then don't listen to those people that say that you're just a rookie. You know, everybody who's out this job, like I just said, everybody who's, who puts their toes on that thin blue line has an opportunity to lead. They have an opportunity to make a huge impact on not just the people of their rank, but of any rank. Cause you know, leadership doesn't have a rank and don't, don't, don't buy into the fact that you don't have something to bring just because you're a rookie. Mm, I love that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Garrett, can you tell everybody again, and I, I'm going to have um, the link to your podcast and how to get a hold of you in the show notes, but can you just tell them how to get a hold of you? Sure. Yeah. The, the show is called the squad room. It's on all the major players, uh, Apple, Apple podcasts and whatever. Uh, the, the website is the squadroom.net. Uh, they can find me on Instagram and Twitter, uh, just at the squad room. And uh, if they want to email me, reach out. I always like uh, talking to people by email. Uh, Garrett, two R's, two T's at the squad room dot net. And uh, we're also on Facebook. If they search out the Facebook's uh, the, the squad room podcast uh, closed group. Oh, hey, closed group. Yeah, we have one of those too. I like that because we get to have good conversation in there. <laughs> yeah, it's really meant for uh, for people to bounce ideas around, share things they're learning, have discussions where they know they're in a safe, safe spot where people can, uh, you know, support each other. We don't put up with the negativity and the saltiness. It's all about just trying to be better and developing ourselves. Absolutely. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Garrett, for being here. And, and this is, this was an excellent episode. And I know that Sheepdog Nation is going to take so much away from this. And thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm really happy that um, we had you on and we found time and, in the busy, you know, cop schedules. We know how that is. <laughs> oh, it's an honor to be on, Autumn. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right, Sheepdog Nation. I will see you next time. And that was another episode of Sheepdog Nation. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes and let us know by giving us a rating. If you have questions that you want answered by Autumn in the podcast, submit it by going to the link in the show notes. As always, stay safe and watch your six.